This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, doesn't it feel like Hamas gets closer every year? It's beginning to feel a lot like Hamas. (laughs) Australian store chain Kmart has pulled a festive gift from its website after a complaint from a Jewish group. The $4 drawstring bag with the phrase Merry Hamas. Hamas. Well, yeah. <laughs> Ham. Hamas. Hamas. It's is a play on the word. Say, it's forget Hamas. So, it's it's just- the most millennial thing that I've ever heard of as well. Like, Hamas. Merry Hamas. Oh, oh my God. I can't wait Hamas. to eat like a whole ham for Hamas. Merry Hamas on the front is designed to hold a Christmas ham with instructions on the back of the product detailing how to store the meat. The Australian Jewish Association said it had politely suggested to be removed from sale because of the unintentional likeness to Hamas, which is a prescribed terrorist group in Australia and several other countries. West Farmers, who owns the retail chain, apologised. According to the now-deleted product page on Kmart's website, the bag featured printed instructions to keep your ham fresh for longer on one side and the words Merry Hamas on the other. Wait, so they had, did you say Australian Jewish Association had just like written to them they or? were actually they were quite chill about it i'll i'll, I'll pay them we they were just like rethink the, uh, this one babes um uh, <laughs> problematic much? like hey girly you may not know this but <laughs> <laughs> why are they looking at handbags anyway if, you, if you're keeping kosher you know why are you interested jewish people don't uh, go aren't allowed to go to kmart no i've always okay. said that um, according to this tweet I saw too, this is from at Rowdy and Ted. Apparently, the bags were still available. Like they pulled it. They like it was a big um, media moment. They said, "Okay, we pulled the bags off our website, but they were still available <laughs> in the store." And this person went to try and buy one, and uh, you can't purchase it. It said, "This this product has been recalled. Please st- please stand by. Help is on its way." It says, "Help is on the way," <laughs> which is you know, it's a nice thing to see on your screen <laughs> when something goes wrong. Help is on the way. Do we have sympathy for the bag people? Like they would have, they would the have designed people? this. The people Kmart? designed the Do bag. I have Kmart, sympathy I for enormous West Farmers chain store Kmart. It may surprise you, dear listener, to learn that I do not. <laughs> what about the little person that just made a nice bag? The, the A is replaced. What do you mean, the little replaced- person? Do you mean like the exploited uh, sweatshop <laughs> worker that sewed the bag? Yeah, I have sympathy for them. Yeah. Exactly. Think about the people who sewed these bags, not knowing about sure. international events that would occur. They all would have happened months ago before the October And the they 7th were really and- attached to that particular product, you know, not being yeah. alienated from its, you know, proceeds at all. <laughs> they, just, they just wanted people to have a lovely hammers. Mm, sure. <laughs> oh, well, next year. When, when, when do you think they're going to keep them and will they be able to use them? In They've got them years, stored in a, in a room somewhere. Yeah. What's happened to them? Do you reckon they burned them or who knows? Donated them to to charity. Yes. Send the funds to Israel. Talk about the Greens. That funny, that bunch of idiots. If you want the dole for life, free marijuana, vote Greens. They don't care about Jews. They don't care about Australia. They don't care about anything except being the ruling elite. And I think it says plenty about the people who vote for them. We're stuck with the hosts of Chapo Shithouse podcast. This is a serious danger in Australia. Hello, everyone. This is Serious Danger, a podcast about Greens politics in Australia. Uh, it is not an official Greens Party podcast. I'm Tom Ballard. That is Emerald Moon. Is that, Hi. Is that your name? Emerald That's, Moon. yeah, Emerald Moon, M O O N. Yeah. Made possible with the help of the Green Institute and is produced by Michael the Griff Griffin. This week we are chatting about the Greens storming out of the Senate in solidarity with Palestine, pulling a university level political stunt. How dare yeah, they? Yeah, student politics. Yuck. And we're going to find out about the very cool fight for democracy that is happening inside the community and public sector union right now, the CPSU, big old union, some members trying to get together and say, hey, can we have some democracy within our union, please? Um, one and democracy, please. And stop, saying, no! stop giving $200,000 a year to labour from our Jews when we're getting absolutely nothing from it. Cheers. If you could, that'd be great. Um, do you know what number episode it is? Number 99. Whoa! And you know what the number is after the number 99? No. 100. You know, it came a little bit real when I saw the show plan. I saw number 99 and remembered that next week we're going to be in uh, Melbourne for our 100th episode celebration live show at Comedy Republic on Burke Street. 
It's going to be so good. There are now less than 25 tickets left. Thank you Wowee. so much to everyone who's bought a ticket. We really appreciate that. We think they're pretty reasonably priced and, yeah, we really appreciate it. If you want to come along, if you're thinking about it, don't miss out. Don't delay. Run. Don't walk to buy tickets <laughs> to our live show on Saturday, November 18th, 5 p.m. Comedy Republic's on Burke Street. Yeah, fantastic comedy venue and will be a really fun place to do the show. And to even sweeten the deal further, but all those people mm. bought tickets thinking they were just going to get you and me, Emerald. Yuck. But <laughs> we can bring even better news, sweeten the deal even further. We have two fantastic guests to confirmed who are going to be joining us on, on the show. Guest announcement. So now you announce them. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, yeah. We're going to be joined on stage <laughs> by writer, academic, and campaigner Hero Badge, which is going to be fantastic, mm-hmm. and comedy superstar, my very good friend, a man with actually great politics who's also a mainstream Australian comedian, Nazim Hussain, everybody. The How only one. The only co- comedian with good politics. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be so much fun. We're going to talk about the news of the week. We'll talk to our two guests about their thoughts on everything. We'll have a laugh. We'll have a cry. We'll start a revolution. Oh. Buy your tickets, everyone. It's going to be good. Is that next weekend that we're doing the revolution? Okay, good. That's what I've scheduled in here, yeah. Um, we also, if you're coming to the live show, extra special deal that you may be able to pick up some merchandise. Uh, well, Patreon Patreon subscribers would have got the first access early access drop on I think Tuesday this week and then other folks may have seen we are finally doing some merch we did a shirt and a sticker with Hannah Wright who also happens to be designer for Greens MPs like Max Chandler made this so you may notice the design is uh, inspired is uh, it draws you know pays homage to some some classic merch designs, but is legally distinct from. But is legally dis- distinct from an unofficial. There's the there's a and serious she did danger. The handmass bag is that right? She did yeah, the, yeah, that's right. Idea. You may recognise okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Serious Dangerous. Um, there's the there's a shirt. It has what does it say on it? A real serious danger to Australia, but it's all cool and it looks nice. Mm-hmm. And then there's a little sticker and it's got Clive Palmer on it saying, if you want the doleful life and free marijuana, vote greens. Pretty good. Again, pretty reasonably priced. We've tried to keep costs as low as humanly possible. If you'd like to wear them, there's lots of different sizes, all the details at our big cartel, seriousdanger.bigcartel.com. We'll put that link in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Uh, If people have ordered merch, you might have a chance to pick up that merch at the live show. If you're in now Melbourne and you're coming along to do that, that's also an option to save on shipping. Avoid shopping. Not not avoid shopping. You must be shopping. Avoid shipping. shipping. Yes, that's an option too. Also, a really quick shout out to our new patrons this week. Thank you to Campbell, Ashley, Michael, Mark, JB, Austin, and Annie. We love you. Thank you so much. For just three bucks a month, you can support the show. And you get bonus content like our episode this week we released where we dived into the nuances, the complications, and the heat of Adabel Crab's kitchen cabinet. Really fun episode. We looked at two (laughs) episodes of the later season. Surprisingly. Yes. And we uh, talked about what we think of that particular show. That's a good one. That's the kind of bonus content you get if you're a Serious Danger patron. Hell yeah. You give us extra hours and an agreement to pass the legislation and we'll keep sitting. I'll make it to you now. Because you know what you've been doing? You said no to Santos. You said no to Woodside. You said no. You've said no to Intex. You've said Uh, no to Minister Wong. You've said no to Korea. You've said no to Japan. You've said yes. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. All right, before we jump into our interview, we're going to chat about the story that continues to dominate the headlines, the biggest, most depressing, bad story, Israel's war on Gaza. We have now entered the second month of this war. Congratulations, everyone. That's fucking insane. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Still horrific shit show, but thankfully millions of people across the world, including the Australian Greens, are calling it out for what it is, are fighting for an immediate ceasefire, and those calls are growing louder and are growing stronger, in my view. Quick update, death toll has now crossed 10,000 Palestinian civilians, including four, more than 4,000 children, which is uh, heartbreaking, obviously. Have you followed all this whole, all the death toll numbers are Hamas yeah. propaganda, you can't trust anything that's coming out of Hamas? Have you heard about this? Yeah, I mean, I know like every time pretty much that that toll is reported, they say it hasn't been able, they haven't been able to independently verify it, obviously, because it's pretty fucking hard to report from a war zone and count all the people that are dying when people are dying on such a massive scale, right? Yes. Yes. And the argument is that these figures come out of the Ministry of Health, which is in Gaza, which is run by Hamas, which is 
just bullshit. Okay, first of all, it's coordinated by the Ministry of Health in um, uh, the West Bank as well. So the Palestinian mm. Authority also has a role in verifying these numbers. But more importantly, historically, people have looked back at previous conflicts and the numbers that eventually come out at a much later date uh, that are verified by the UN pretty yeah. much match up with the same numbers that come out of the Ministry of Health out yeah. of Gaza. Okay, there are some discrepancies, not statistically significant, but generally in the ballpark, at least when we're talking about thousands of deaths, uh, these numbers are really quite reliable. But also, there was an extra wrinkle this week when there was a story, and I don't think this has been independently verified yet. But there was a story about a Israeli mil- military source leaking the fact that the death toll could be closer to twenty thousand. Okay, so everyone's saying, oh, these Hamas numbers of propaganda yeah. could actually be lowballing by 100% um, the actual death toll that we're talking about. Mm. I mean, I have seen the IDF also saying, yeah, well, 10,000 people have died. We have, however, hit 60 plus Hamas targets, <laughs> as in, so like 99.5% or whatever civilian casualties, right. if that's true. Brilliant. There's a, I think there's only like seventeen or eighteen thousand known members of Hamas too. So mm. again, it's it's they're getting close to killing yeah. more members than there are actual people in Hamas. But of course, it's not really about that, yeah. or they don't give a shit about the civilian casualties and the collateral damage along the way. As we're clearly seeing, what with all the war crimes they're doing. Approximately 1.5 million people in Gaza have been displaced. Very hard to comprehend what that looks like. 1.5 million people evacuating an area now. Mm. And the picture of what it's like there is, of course, terrifying. This is from Schwartz Media's reporting from this morning, Friday morning. More than half a million displaced people have crammed into hospitals and schools turned shelters in the south, strewn with rubbish and swarmed by flies as they become a breeding ground for infectious diseases. Supermarket shelves are nearly empty, with many people going weeks without meat, eggs or milk and are now living on one meal a day as fights break out in bread lines. Mm. And I was listening to an interview with a someone from Save the Children, talking about what it looks like when uh, you're trying to practice medicine and save lives in these kind of conditions. Uh, Operations are being conducted without anaesthetic. People are using dish towels instead of bandages. They're using phone lights to light up their surgeries. I could go on. I'm sure people, if they're following the news, are hearing horrific things every single day about the situation. I'm interested in whether you think it's all still present or front of mind in Australia, in the Australian context anyway, as to whether these stories of, of horror are still cutting through. And I, I guess I just noticed this week that you saw other things mm. taking precedence, things like China, interest mm. rate rise on Tuesday, up oh, just shitting itself. Yeah. I don't know. Do you think it's still the continuing it's not ongoing as, situation? Or it's is it not fading? as prominent in the news as it has been. Like I've noticed, yeah, and I, in response to that, I've noticed a shift with people being like, please don't turn away because there's also – yeah, like I guess there's a limit um, on the media interest, but there yeah. is that fatigue of, you know, watching horror unfold and wanting to turn away and mm. increasingly people being like, please don't, you know, please don't turn away. <laughs> Which is, again, just another like structurally structural failure in our media. Like, oh, we mm. can't keep talking about the same story. Well, the mm-hmm. same story is still going like every single day. So. Mm. Maybe you should prioritise actually reporting what's happening in the world as opposed to, oh, we've done that. We've done Israel mm-hmm. Gaza now. We but on. they no doubt would be seeing fewer people clicking on stories about mm. Gaza and being like, oh, well, that's not not getting clicks. That's not what people want to want to read. News so, achieved. Something else. Next. Yeah. Unlocked. Yeah. So despite all this horror, the Albanese Labor government is still running its bullshit line calling for humanitarian pauses in the fighting <laughs> Completely in lockstep with the US and the Tory government. Boo, fuck you all. Foreign Minister Penny Wong isn't even prepared to describe what Israel is doing as collective punishment, even though it's just like clearly that's what it is. It's Mm. textbook shit. Israel is saying we will not commit to a ceasefire until they release the hostages, which is just blatantly admitting the fact that you are carpet bombing a civilian population because of the acts of this terror group, Hamas, right? And until they release the hostages, which ordinary Palestinians have nothing to do with, we're keep gonna we're gonna keep bombing you and killing you and destroying and leveling your your society and moving in to basically occupy uh your apparently sovereign uh country, even though we don't even respect that. Have you have you called any of the ministers recently? I haven't done a call yet. I should call Penny Wong's office. Yes, I should mm. definitely do that. I did email my MP last week. He replied with a shitty response. Mm. I replied to that. He hasn't got back to me yet. Mm. Come on, Daniel Molina. I know you listen, Daniel. 
Get yeah. in touch. I mean, I will say, like, as someone who works in an MP's office, calling is mm. certainly harder to ignore. So if you can, yeah. if you think you're calling or emailing, call. I've, yeah, I've only called Penny Wong's office once, but I was surprised. Like, I got through. So clearly not enough people are calling to jam right. the lines, which they probably should be. And, yeah, the the staffer that I spoke to was like, oh, well, we're calling for a humani- humanitarian pause rather than a ceasefire because we think it's more likely. And I'm like, God, the way your fucking brain works. And then, but then just moments later, she said, oh, well, she is privately, you know, pushing for a, for a ceasefire. And I was like, oh, okay. So you think a ceasefire would be good, it's but good. you can't call for that. You can't say that publicly, publicly. right? And why might that be? Like- why yeah. might that be? Because you're fucking cowards. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's crazy they admitted that, really. That's, yeah. that's pretty wild. Oh, my Lord. How long did you stand that? How long did it go for? A little while, probably a few minutes. I kind of, you know, just kept pushing until I then got too um, angry and, <laughs> uh, yeah, and and closed. But, I, I mean, I was thinking, yes, like I should really call back and say, so three days ago, you said, mm. you know, we think a humanitarian pause is more likely and that's why we're not calling for a ceasefire. And it's like, okay, has the pause happened? No, people, they were saying, oh, well, our, our, our priority is, you know, getting civilians out. And like, okay, well, civilians are continuing to die. There's been no humanitarian pause. Now will you fucking call for something? Because clearly like your little softly, softly approach is not working and you should be using your power to actually call for a ceasefire that doesn't then resume after a certain period. Anyway. <laughs> it's just, they act as if... Israel's actions are like a weather event. It's like a natural yeah. disaster, right? Like there's nothing can be done to, to stop the rain of bombs and terror mm. that are, are raining down on the civilian population, even though we support them militarily, we support them diplomatically. Our ally, the US, who is apparently a really good friend, is also just sending them $4 billion a year. Mm. And I think I've recently asked for $14 billion in extra funding now. Like that's just going to happen. So we've just got to get the people out of the way. Like, yeah. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are reports this morning, again, the US is saying Israel is agreeing to daily four-hour pauses in the fighting to allow people to flee mm-hmm. along two humanitarian corridors and potentially return Israeli hostages. Yeah, so some people, like some people, sure, are fleeing. And, I mean, the I think the images of people, you know, fleeing with white flags above their heads are yeah. incredibly moving. But, like, but yeah, so the four-hour pauses... When there's often little notice, there's pro- there, a lot of these places have no, you know, no power, no internet, no no phone, etc. And you're meant to get that notification and then get all of your shit and somehow get out without getting caught, uh, you know, without getting killed. Like there are so many people still stranded, and they will, as we know from experience, then bomb those areas and say, "Well, we told you to leave." And every time you resume the bombing, you will need more humanitarian aid. So it's just yes. a self defeating process. It's it's insane. And also, look, I still haven't got a confirmed reporting on this too. But there's there's quite a few. Hamas at one point was claiming that sixty Israeli hostages had been killed in this air assault. Right. So yeah. of course, as Israel bombs the place where the hostages are being kept, surprise, surprise, if some of those hostages are going to be killed, You're killing their revealing the fact hostages. that you don't actually care no. about these hostages at all, and you actually just want to wipe out and ethnically cleanse the space of Gaza. That's yeah, and it, yes, doing. again, like it's like it's so hard to verify everything that you see on social media, but I've seen images of um, IDF soldiers, you know, holding up the Israeli flag in Gaza and saying, you know, basically this land is now ours again. We're here to and stay. Yeah. We're here to stay. Yes, exactly. Like really laying bare that it's not just about responding to the capture of of, of hostages. Uh, it is about fucking colonising that Palestinian land. Yeah. It's almost like they want Israel from the river to the sea. To the sea. Hmm. Hmm. Well, thankfully, once again, the only good political party <laughs> of the Greens took action this week, are trying to, I think, primarily, you know, keep this in the news, make it very clear, mm. uh, mount pressure and increase calls for the ceasefire. They took two actions um, this week calling for uh, an immediate ceasefire and walking out of the Senate. On Monday, Maureen Fruki wore a black and white kef- kefeya. Am I pronouncing that correctly? I think I'm, I'm not sure. Kefeya? Kefeya, yeah. And she asked Trade Minister Don Farrell about Australia abstaining from the UN vote calling for ceasefire. We talked about that on last week's show. She then described Labor as heartless, gutless cowards and said, The coalition is morally bankrupt when it comes to Palestine. And Labor has shown itself to be heartless, gutless cowards. You are watching the massacre of thousands of Palestinians by Israel, and you are not condemning Israel. You refuse to call for an immediate ceasefire. Well, we are not going to sit here and watch you pat yourselves on the back 
for doing nothing. Weasel words are not going to stop war crimes. Today, we bring the people's protest into parliament. Free, free Palestine. Uh, thank you, Senator Fariki. Uh, she then led a walk out of the Senate, followed by all the Green senators, including Janet Rice holding up a little Palestine, Palestine flag sign, which mm -hmm. was cool. Uh, then on Thursday, Jordan Still John moved a motion calling for a ceasefire, gave a very impassioned speech, very moving one, I thought. Um, and the Green Senators once again all held up signs saying ceasefire now. And obviously that was terrible because props in the Senate Stop. are completely forbidden. Israel can do war crimes, that's fine. But we mm. can't have senators holding up signs in the Senate. That's very attention naughty. seeking children. <laughs> Uh, what do you make of these protests, Emerald? Almost as though strategy. they're seeking to draw attention to something. <laughs> to themselves. <laughs> right, yeah. That's why they held up pictures of themselves as opposed to holding up an extremely clear message. <laughs> Two words. What did you think of these protests? Was that, Were you glad to see them? Yeah, of course. Like, it again, one of those moments that we talk about on this show that make me glad and proud to be part of the Greens and not a gutless fucking party like Labor or any of the others. Mm. I mean, again, as we say, as the media interest might be fading somewhat, at least in the Australian context, um, about these kind of issues, anything that pushes them into uh, the headlines once again, of course, the hostile corporate media will turn it into the Greens are trying to make this about them. I mean, mm. the response to this was, was pretty amazing. Like Foreign Minister Petty Wong claimed the Greens were seeking to make a political point. <laughs> Hey, in Parliament, a do you know party? what your fucking job is? Like, <laughs> Christ. Mm. Opposition Senate Leader Simon Birmingham labelled the Greens' intervention as pathetic and questioned how a ceasefire would work in practice. The serious and complex issues in Israel and Gaza require a far more sombre and considered response than the childish stunts and university tactics of the Australian Greens. You know what? It actually doesn't. Like, it's actually not that complicated to say that killing kids is really bad, Simon. I know, like, you think it's like you got to be really smart, four-dimensional chess, like smart international affairs brain guy, but actually killing children and committing a genocide against an oppressed, occupied people is bad. And I'm actually pretty confident mm. saying that Believe in really simple not. terms, that's bad, we shouldn't support that, and we should support the people who are saying that we should stop doing that. Mm. I don't know, I'm crazy. You know, the other thing that I think is worth pointing out is I know from, from what I've been hearing, particularly from people working in those federal offices that have been doing so much to yeah call for a ceasefire, is... Palestinian people, you know, expressing how much that means to them to see at least someone in that arena standing in mm. solidarity with them and fighting for them. Like it does mean something, even though it can feel frustrating that, yeah, we, you know, we don't necessarily have the power to make those decisions. I think it does mean something to make people feel represented and, and stood with. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you've seen some people who are a bit like, I don't know, Hanging on to hope, I suppose. If you know, if Palestine and mm. in particular was an issue for them, they were maybe investing some hope. And you did have some noises, which we talked about on the show before, a Labor government saying they'd you know recognize a Palestinian state, mm. yada yada yada. But I guess you know when the rubber hits the road in this in this mother of all crunch moments, Labor has completely folded, revealed themselves to not take a stand or grow a spine about this stuff at all. Completely throw their lot in with uh, the US, the West, and defend Israel to the hilt. And people are saying, you know, respect to the Greens for actually taking a stand when it matters. You know? mm. Peter from Darling Point in New South Wales was not impressed. He wrote a letter to the editor in The Australian. Peter, it's a great what do you got to say? Oh, Paul. Well, this is pretty funny. This is no, no, like... Paul, not Peter. Or is it? Oh, Paul. Sorry, it is Paul. Yeah, sorry. Paul, Peter, it's all the same. Same. I'm rubbing Peter to pay Paul. It's a great pity the Greens don't stage a walk out of Parliament every day. Owned. <laughs> <laughs> True. Better places to be. <laughs> yeah, go do something useful. <laughs> Get the fuck out of there. I think my favourite response came from Bill Shorten. I, I don't know. He was just being interviewed by the ABC and was weighing in. And I think sometimes this we forget just how dumb Bill Shorten is. Like, I forget I think, that he still exists. He still so, exists. Like, he's kind of still frequently in the news and yet every single time I'm like, oh, Bill, <laughs> oh, okay. I don't think the Greens walking out helps a single soul anywhere. I think that is just... Um, political grandstanding. Imagine a politician doing political grandstanding in the parliament. Labor would never do such a thing. But then he said this, and this drove me truly out of my mind. They don't walk out over Hamas. So, you know, I just think these guys are opportunists. Okay. Like this what is- What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, because 
This is something that people. I've seen other people being like, oh, why don't the Greens make as much noise about these other human rights abuses that are happening right. in XYZ country, like, you know, Uyghurs in, in China, for example. Yep. And it's like because the Greens are the only voice standing in solidarity with Palestine on this issue, the whole point is that they are protesting the silence and the lack of action from the institution that they are in, from everyone else in parliament. It's a protest. Yes. If you, you have to be protesting something for yes. it to be a protest. If everyone agrees with you, why would you walk out on them? Why would you <laughs> protest? Out. So, like, the parliament, like, sets up a motion to condemn Hamas and the Greens walk out on on that yeah. or on the toga of the 7th they were supposed to walk out in the Senate. What the fuck are you talking about? You're an adult. Where everyone's like, great, we agree, and they're like, we agree ferociously and leave. <laughs> Fucking stupid. And the same deal, uh, this this was from last week too, Regina Spector. Okay, so I don't know if you've been following all the celebrity takes on the various mm. on the conflict, and we've lost some real faves along the way. We've lost Regina Spector, who I love. I mean, I guess, you know, I knew she's Jewish herself. She has family living in Israel. She's performed in Israel before. I probably, if I'd investigated newer politics on this particular issue in the past, I love Regina Spector's music. It means a lot to me. But, uh, yeah, she's lost her fucking mind. We've lost Amy Schumer. Jerry Seinfeld, of course, has thrown his lot in. Um, and his, I'm his not surprised Jessica by any of these. Film. I don't care. I mean, but yeah, yeah okay. Is there none of your fave, your faves, your slip faves have had problematic takes. Surely. I don't have many fave celebrities. <laughs> Maybe that's. <laughs> Wait, has Taylor said anything about Israel? I don't think uh, so. Oh no, I think she cancelled. She, she cancelled shows in Israel. But I mean, as you would, because it's probably quite dangerous. So I don't know if that's re- like people were saying. Oh, like, oh, yes. Oh, you mean recently? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I feel as though she may, yeah, anyway, I've seen something about her being on, you know, the right side, but I feel like she hasn't exactly been explicit. So, Taylor Swift, if you're listening, first of all, please let me get into the ticket <laughs> lounge in which I've been waiting for ages for resale tickets. Second of all, please stand in solidarity with Palestine call for a ceasefire. <laughs> that's, that's all we ask, Taylor. Yeah. Is that too much? But Regina posted this this statement that I think is really revealing. Why do you call for a ceasefire instead of for Hamas to surrender? While hostages aren't returned, while rockets from Hamas fall, while hate crimes against Jews are up all over the world, while you ignorantly and flippantly use words like apartheid, colonizer, Zionist, genocide, and Mm -hmm. spread lies hate about the Jewish people. You're aligning with terrorists who pledge to kill every last Jew in the Middle East, the planet, and to destroy all free society. A ceasefire so they can regroup, rearm, and massacre again? I can't afford to be as kind and moral as you, I guess. I'll just call for Hamas to surrender and bring those hostages safely home. Here are some better calls to action. Return the hostages, Hamas surrender, free Palestinian civilians from terrorist rule and this war. So you're happy for Hamas to surrender and for Israel to continue... Like it's brutal violence and and occupation in Palestine. Yeah, that would free be a Palestinian win. civilians from this te- horrible terrorist rule they're receiving from Hamas, who are what raining bombs down upon them and killing ten thousands of them. Like, who oh, do you think no, wait, Palestinians? That's, that's actually that's Israel. the other guys. But it's just again so revealing the complete ignorance or lack of recognition of the fact that people in America. She's obviously you know mainly speaking to Americans protesting there. America has no, isn't giving $4 billion a year to Hamas. Yeah. Okay. They support the state of Israel explicitly. So yes. protesting on the streets of America, calling for a ceasefire, is pressuring the Amer- American government to do something about its close ally, who it loves, Israel, mm. to stop killing these innocent civilians. You have to know that. Yeah. You have to know that there's a difference. Yeah. You have to know there's an asymmetry of warfare here. Israel has fucking nukes, for God's sakes. I, I don't, yeah. I really don't know how these people's brain works. I Honestly, I don't understand. And, of course, our good friend, LGBTQI ally, Pauline Hanson, who we were celebrating on last week's show. Oh, yeah. Um, What's the queen got to say now? <laughs> well, she's she's another problematic fave, I had oh, to report. Oh, no, not Pauline Hanson. In response to Maureen Faruqi's <laughs> protest, Hanson said she would take the Pakistani-born Faruqi to the airport and put you on a plane and wave you away. Hasn't Obviously. she said... Almost like something very similar previously. Yeah, I mean, she's being sued by Maureen for a tweet she said that was basically similar because she's saying in the parliament, of course, this is all protected by parliamentary privilege. So she she's can't such be a sued fucking waste that. of space. She does suck Honestly. big time. Um, she was asked to withdraw those comments in the Senate. She refused to do so. She said she'd need time to think about it. She offered Faruqi a tissue. 
like an asshole would. Eventually, though, uh, she avoided further censure by withdrawing unparliamentary comments made to Green Senator Marine Faruqi, but not before her party sent out fundraising emails accusing the Greens of trying to shut Pauline Hanson down. Right, okay. Whatever. She also later said on Sky, on, uh, Sky News with Chris Kenny, uh, they, the Greens, are purely haters of the Jewish community. They say free Palestine. We've got to be fair in our assessment of what's happened with Palestine and Israel and what's happened in our streets here in Australia as well. I don't believe that it's the place in the Senate for that stunt to be carried out. You wore a burqa in there, you crazy yeah. motherfucker. Yeah, got to respect the institution of the Senate. I would never do a stunt in the Senate. Not me, Pauline Hanson. <laughs> she also received some support from the Australian Jewish Association. They took time out from worrying about the, the hand mess bags. They tweeted out a clip of Hanson speaking in Parliament during which she said, A vote for the Greens is a vote for terrorism. And they said, Senator Pauline Hanson speaking common sense and calling out the anti-Semitic Greens. I, um. Maybe you're about, I think you're about to say this, but it's like, yeah. are we really thinking that Pauline Hansen is going to like, would, I mean, even now, but historically wouldn't be on the side of the anti-Semites? Uh, uh, would be on the side of the anti-Semites, yes. Has happily mm. palled around with anti-Semites. I mean, she's a racist unequivocally. She's yeah. a leader of a party that had a candidate who mowed a swastika into his lawn in the great state yeah. of Greensland. That was part of it. And this was kicking around from 2001. <laughs> Uh, Pauline Hanson, who sat for a term in Parliament as the sole representative of the One Nation Party, was invited to speak at an event in South Australian Press Club. Hanson's 45-minute address was punctuated by applause and shouts of encouragement from Frederick Tobin, who served a prison term in Germany for Holocaust denial and whose distribution of anti-Semitic material on the internet has been declared unlawful in Australia. During the question and answer session, Hanson said, Tobin is probably like a lot of other Australians that he is supporting me here today and I thank him. I thought, because I was going to be like, you know, if someone shows up to your thing and, and support, like, yes, there's always the argument about whether that's, you can control that and that necessarily means you agree with them. But she literally, so she knew who he was and she was yep, like. that guy. Yeah, I love that guy. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's a really good example, once again, from the Australian Jewish Association, the the bad faith levels of anti-Semitism, what they mean by anti-Semitism is mm. mean a criticism of Israel and they will, in fact, happily side with someone who is so blatantly bigoted and racist like Pauline mm. Hansen, if she's in some way trying to depict people like the Greens, who are simply stating the truth and are standing up for Palestinian rights, uh, as mm. anti-Semites. Like, really easy shortcut. That's how le the level of bad faith that comes with these critiques of anyone trying to say, hey, Israel committing war crimes is really bad. It's nothing to do with the fact that they're Jewish. It's because war crimes are bad, actually. Mm, quite simple, actually. <laughs> Finally, a little bit of good news. Shout out to the Block the Boat pro protesters in Melbourne who successfully forced Israel shipping line Zim, Z-I-M, to reschedule the arrival of a cargo ship into the port of Melbourne. Uh, they occupied the road leading to the container terminal for 12 hours, which is pretty amazing. I think there were like 300 people wow. there. Damn. Um, Zim is Australia's largest uh, is Israel's largest shipping company and has a long history of supplying the Israeli military. Last month they were like, we're here for you, Israel. We will support the national needs of Israel including obviously its needs. All of your weapons. During the war on Gaza. So solidarity to those folks and you're seeing similar kind of actions across the world, which is great. Mm. And, you know, guess who agrees with the crazy university stupid greens, the little hippies, they're so far left, they're so marginalised, they're so out of touch with everybody else. It's Nazis? I don't know. <laughs> Terrorists? The majority of Australians. Oh. <laughs> This week, YouGov released a poll showing 53% support from Australians for an immediate ceasefire, with just 26% opposed to one. How about that? 23% of respondents said they'd be more likely to vote for Labor if it supported a wow. ceasefire. And the 11% said they'd be less likely to do so. I assume the other 66% Yeah, that it wouldn't neutral. affect their vote. It wouldn't affect I their guess. vote, I suppose. Now, yes, this poll was commissioned by the Australian... Palestine Advocacy Network, but it was conducted mm -hmm. by YouGov. Okay, YouGov are highly mm -hmm. respected. It had over a thousand statistically weighted respondents. YouGov is very reliable, and people will obviously like to point to the fact it was commissioned by APAN to say it's biased, it shouldn't be listened to. That's just not true. Yeah. And it fits in with a similar picture across the Western world. 76% of Brits support a ceasefire. That's from YouGov as well. And a data progress poll in America found 66% support for a ceasefire amongst Americans, including 80% of Democrats. And 56% of Republicans. Okay. Whoa. 56% of Republicans. Yeah. Once again. That's astounding. The public far to the left, yeah. far more progressive, far more sensible than the fucking bloodthirsty psychopaths in our political yeah. class. Mm-hmm.
These join 18 international aid agencies, including UNICEF, the World Health Organization, Save the Children, Amnesty International, and the United Nations itself, calling for an immediate ceasefire. So I just want to underline this because you will hear from insane media commentators and the political class that a ceasefire is a ridiculous um, uh, utopian call and uh, anybody calling for it doesn't understand what's happening in the Middle East, doesn't understand military strategy, blah, 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 blah. They're just wrong, okay, and they're lying to you and you have to hang on to this very basic idea that the vast majority of people in these countries across the West see what's happening for what it is and want it to end. I can tell that no matter how horrific the atrocities committed by Hamas October 7th were, they do not justify carpet bombing and committing genocide against Palestine. Yeah, believe it or not, yeah, ordinary people actually have a brain and a heart, just politicians don't. (laughs) Join those calls. Go to standwithpalestine.au. That's got information about how you can uh, contact your MP. You can call them or email them. The rally information there is not updated at the moment. It's all from last weekend, at least time of recording. But keep an eye on that website. That sort of really helps Australians, people in Australia, with a whole bunch of different things you can find out to take action. Standwithpalestine.au. Heard of Adam Mayers is a rank and file unionist and an activist who's running for election as Deputy National President of the Community and Public Sector Union, aka the CPSU. So Adam's on the Members United ticket, which is basically an unaffiliated group of rank and file CPSU members who are contesting various positions in this upcoming election for the CPSU governing structure. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hello, comrade. I'm a former CPSU member when I worked Are at the ABC. Yes, and I did absolutely nothing, but I did pay my dues. So I feel like you, you wow. are unfortunately not alone. You're not. You're not. You're not. Uh, yeah, on your own in that on that front. And that's that's hopefully something where we're looking to change. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is, Maybe. Is, yeah. M- members. There's a lot of members who who may want to do more, but uh, really don't have an opportunity to. So um, mm. no, you're not alone on that front, Tom. I was focused yeah. on getting fired and uh, being, mm. <laughs> being censored by the ABC. Bit so busy getting. That was, yeah. That was, yeah getting my schedule. From your job anyway to make it better. I, I respect you, appreciate all your work. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we wanted to, yeah, give listeners a bit of an insight into why this particular kind of insurgency from within the CPSU is a pretty big deal. Maybe you can give us a, a rundown, rundown on, yeah, why this is something that people should actually care about this like union election. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there hasn't been a contested, like a fully contested executive committee election in the CPSU for almost two decades. Um, there's a history across pretty much all unions of contested democratic elections for executive positions, for kind of organising committee positions, but mm-hmm. that tradition's died off in recent years and the CPSU mm-hmm. is certainly part of that that dying off process. Um, people contest elections, like contest positions individually um, every election time, but, um, yeah, a lot of the time executive positions go completely uncontested, a lot of governing council positions, so that's kind of rank and file, uh, the rank and file membership with how they um, interact with the executive is through governing council. A lot of those positions go completely uncontested. A lot of them go unfilled because no one runs. Um, so it's really exciting that we have a ticket up. Um, uh, that 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 is is quite historic, I guess. Um, but also, I think uh, you would have seen there's been some reporting about you know it, it's a bunch of greens like Labor left, tankies, trots, blah blah. blah. There's, there was a good article in the Mandarin about that. And um, and I guess one of the best parts about this this group, and it's not just the ticket, it's a caucus that we've set up over the last past few months called Democracy for CPSU. But one of the mm-hmm. most awesome parts about this this whole thing is that it is a genuinely broad left group, like a, a broad unionist group. Mm-hmm. There's people who were involved in Labor right, there's people involved in Labor left, Greens, Communist Party, Maoist groups, revolutionary feminist groups, and then tons of people who are completely unaffiliated. Um, and the fact that we are all able to sit around a table together and, and say, yep, yeah, we've got a shared interest in making our union function better is really, really exciting and I think reflects the fact that a lot of members are frustrated with how the union's been functioning for the last decade, few decades, um, and now's the time to make a change. Yeah, I think one of the critiques that I had seen is, so this is, you know, one of Australia's biggest trade unions, uh, I think, what, more than 40,000 members. It's an ALP-affiliated union, which we'll get into further because I know that that's kind of one of the big questions that your ticket is, you know, wants to put to the membership. Um, but 
the uh, the critique is that this is a group of people saying, you know, we meet, we need more uh, leadership of the union that's actually connected to to workers rather than just the political class. And people are saying that everyone on the ticket is, is it true? Everyone on the ticket is a staffer, but I guess no, the no, <laughs> no, okay, because that's something that I <laughs> read, so you can tell us. <laughs> no, no, and there's yeah, there's been lots of lots of um, messaging on that. So I'm I'm a public servant. Um, the okay. majority of our EC ticket are public servants. So of the ticket, there's six people, four are public servants, and then two are staffers, one for Labor, one for Greens. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then across our governing council, so we've got 20-odd candidates for governing council as well. So it's not just the six, it's 20, mm. 20 others. And there's no staffers in that group. Like the vast majority of our group and the caucus that we're coming out of are public servants. And what about the current, I guess, how does that compare to the current leadership? So the current leadership of the six, our understanding is that only one has ever worked in the public service um, and that was for a few months in the 90s. So they've all come through, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, which is unfortunate for a public sector union. And, I, and yes. I, don't, I don't think it would go down well in like, you know, the CFMEU or the MUA if, if no. their leadership yeah. had never worked on the docks or worked on the construction site. But in the, in the CPSU, it's taken for, for granted or taken as given that, yeah, you can come through the CPSU itself and the majority of the leadership does um, and then you become the leaders of the union. So of the six, all the members of the Labor Party, Melissa Donnelly, mm-hmm. who's the general, um, uh, is the, the secretary of the union, um, mm-hmm. she is a member of the ALP executive, so the National mm-hmm. Executive of the Union, sitting on the sa- in the same table as um, Albo and Katie Gallagher and um, and the likes. So, yeah, and there's a long history of that. So Stephen Jones, who's in the Labor um, uh, government at the moment, he was a former leader of the CPSU. Um, so, yeah, there's it, it's, it's a big contrast. Yeah, yeah. So um, how does that, I mean, how does that happen though? Like how do those people end up in those positions? How are the elections usually run that somehow these completely disconnected just like hacks are running the union. So as a, there's a bit of history to this. Uh, we, I wrote an article um, with one of our other candidates, Adriana, in Jacobin on this very issue. We can, um, we'll link to that in the show notes, by the way. It's a good awesome. article. Awesome. Um, um, but basically there is uh, uh, this caucus within the union called Progressive Caucus. They are AAP. AAP oh, well, hang on, hang oh, that on. sounds that great. That sounds really good. Sounds we're, good. We're progressive people. We like things to be progressive. So uh, what are you complaining about? What, exactly, exactly. Exactly. Well, unfortunately, Progressive Caucus, maybe maybe the original intent was progressive <laughs> and maybe they think, you know, maybe they're progressive on certain issues. But in terms of, uh, you know, growing the membership of the union and uh, the union being a fighting one, they're not particularly progressive. Um, but, yeah, and that, that that's a group. It's kind of self-selected you get a kind of tap on the shoulder and then you pay some sort of like dues not sure exactly what that is into a fund and then through that fund they have been funding their own uh, candidates for each election and so for the past couple of decades every single member of the executive committee that has run on their affiliated ticket and got up um, because this progressive caucus and their candidates have been in charge for 30 odd years almost or 20 odd years yeah, so you come through Progressive Caucus, it's funded by um, people within the caucus and then they just hit hit members with mail-outs. So any position that's that's mm. um, that's contested. So in our election, they have sent out to a number of uh, a number of us, including myself, multiple mail-outs. So it's not just one saying, hey, here's who else mm. we stand for. They've sent one for the national executive and then one for like my section, so ACT government. Um, so it's just... Yeah, it's it's a really it's a really strange way of running things, and because the bar is so high with like mail out costs and running costs, people just don't have the energy, the time, or the resources to contest these elections. Um, so they just they go uncontested. Yeah, my understanding was there was a ticket, like a rank and file ticket, that contested the twenty twenty election called Fight to Win. But was that kind of a small that wasn't contesting all positions or? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so they didn't contest all the uh, they didn't contest the EC positions. Um, mm-hmm. There was one person, um, Matt Partridge, who did uh, had had a really awesome um, candidate statement and was definitely had a lot of the same kind of ideas that we have. But he mm-hmm. ran on his own. He didn't do any campaigning really, um, and he he came within a thousand votes of winning. Um, uh, the position that he ran for on the exec, Not but fine. fight to win were based uh, out of Services Australia, if I'm mm-hmm. to understand it, primarily, and uh, yeah, they they ran in their specific um, section and, right. and electorates. But in terms of like East, the EC, we haven't had a ticket since 2007. Yeah. Okay. So, what are, can you run us through briefly? What are the key things that you're actually running on? Like, what's the platform? 
Yeah, for sure. So the the big headline one is 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 reinvigorating democracy within the union. So the union has democratic structures on paper, right? You have like you're a member, you become a delegate. Mm. You're a delegate, you become a section councillor, which is like the the group that that has that puts forward motions and is the voice for your section. So I'm in ACT government, I can go on ACT government section council. And mm. then the next step up is governing council. And governing council is rank and filers who are voted into that position as governing councillor um, for their section, and they are meant to lead the strategic strategic direction of the union. So the executive okay. committee is meant to be beholden to that group, really. Um, executive committee sit on governing council, but not above governing council. That's the mm-hmm. concept. In theory, yeah. So the structures are kind of there, but um, so many section councils just don't exist, right? There isn't the interest from the membership because members don't really know about it. The density mm-hmm. isn't high enough. So a lot of places don't have a section council. A lot of um, governing council spots are vacant um, and most members don't really know about this structure. So there is potential there, but there just isn't the engagement with members to make that a kind of thriving democratic process, a democratic structure. So we're very keen to reinvigorate that, to set up section councils in sections where there isn't one at the moment, to get all those governing council spots filled um, and to put a lot more power in the hands of these governing councils, these rank and filers, to direct the union, to make decisions about how the union is run. So there's that democracy bit and there's a density question as well. Like the density of the union has just been deteriorating for decades now. Um, Between 2007 and 2022, the union's lost net 18,000 members. So the 18,000 fewer fewer members today than there was in 2007. Um, and at the same time, the, the the potential membership base through ACT government, APS, Northern Territory government has increased significantly. Like the ACT government's growing up by like 40% since 2007, and yet density is decreasing. Um, so and we and think perhaps that- like unlike some other professions, uh, Adam, you know, the, the public mm. service has been a traditionally high density, mm. quite active, strong unionized workforce, exactly. right? Like you had people with a sense of public service, yeah. often a pe- people with a sense of coll- collectivity and working together to try and, yeah. you know, win stuff both in the work they do, but also in their, their own organizing within the workforce. So, you know, the fall in density, which is a trend across all workforces, is particularly distressing and acute and a real failure on the CPSU when it comes to the public service. Yeah. Yeah, and there's so much potential there as well. Like even so, in ACT government, for example, there's, a, there's an explicit union encouragement policy from the government. Like mm. uh, people are, are supported to become engaged with the union, and the fact mm. that people aren't engaging the union, I think, reflects really poorly on the way that the union is currently run. Um, we want to make the union like an exciting prospect for people. It's not just something you do because it's a mo- morally correct or oh, I've got a dispute mm. and I want to get it resolved. You join the union because the union has utility, and you want to work with you know your colleagues in the workplace to get better better conditions better pay for you um and so that's what we're we're really keen to get more power in the hands of the rank and file and say we are public servants primarily we are members we understand your concerns we understand what it's like to work in your kind of working environments and we want to like lift you up we want to give you a voice um and and support you to fight to get better conditions and to stop the kind of deterioration of public service conditions that we're seeing across all public parts of the public sector yeah, because there's been, I mean, it, it seems as though part of this push is to actually yeah, be more of a radical union that will be a bit more militant and fight for stuff like above inflation yeah. pay rises. As, as I understand it, you've got an offer currently that's like 11.2% pay rise over three years, um, which is yeah. obviously that's below inflation, right? And what's yeah. the union's response to that, you know? <laughs> So there's been two there's been two bargains this year. There's one in ACT government, which has been com- largely completed, and then there's the Australian Public Service one for all Commonwealth workers, which is the 11.2 percent one. So um, in both cases, the CPSU claim was not particularly radical. So that's what the CPSU put on the table. So in the ACT gov, it was CPI plus one percent or three percent, whatever's higher. So we went to the government and said, like, inflation's crazy. We're only asking mm. for inflation so keep our wages you know keep keep up with the cost mm-hmm. of living plus a little bump of one percent so it's mm-hmm. not particularly radical and act government came back with this convoluted offer um that didn't guarantee wage rises really real wage rises for pretty much anyone um and and we went, went through a process uh i was involved in that through section council i pushed really hard for rallies never happened we were told by the executives that no one would Too turn crazy. up um, yeah, oh, like okay. it, it just, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It was too, super disappointing. They were just like, no, I'm, <laughs> a rally saying, I'm saying, for a union never been yeah, done. And we were saying, that wouldn't uh, work. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and at the same time, this is what really, really frustrated me. At the same time, the CFMEU did a rally because they, they have a small um, subsection of the uh, public service membership through government service officers mm. in the ACT. So they're the people who like clean the toilets and pick up rubbish off the streets. And their workers had just atrocious pay and conditions. Like there was, you know, stories of people sleeping in their cars because the pay was just so low. And so the CFMEU 
Economy EU ran before even negotiations had fully begun, ran rallies. Like there was mm. up to 100 people in um, around the relevant office in, in Canberra. They all got together. They were CFMEU members. There were people like me who just were there, you know, to support. There was a conference on. They got everyone from like people from New Zealand, who you know, trade union movement in New Zealand, in, in from this conference to get involved. And they went up before work and went to the office and like spoke directly to the CEO, who probably wasn't even there, and just said, this isn't good enough and like got, you know, and and got their members to speak out. And it was really, really impactful. And surprise, surprise, the CFMU got absolutely what they wanted in that, in that, in that bargain. Mm. So in our case, yeah, no rallies, no one will turn up. We pushed really hard for protected industrial action. There hadn't been protected industrial action in the ACT for 23 years, um, which I think reflects, you wow. know, just how kind of the, 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 the industrial muscle was atrophied. Mm. And we got it, we got votes up again with a lot of like a lot of hard work from delegates um not from the 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 union themselves um but then it was never never used like we we enlivened it by taking you know an hour off work but then it just died a death because they again just weren't interested in in actually using it to to push for a better offer um so that was the act gov example that's flown into the aps where there's a claim of 20 percent over three years which again is really reasonable like if you look at the the, um, projections for inflation there's a chance even that won't keep up with inflation Mm. um it does very little to remedy like a decade of wage stagnation in the commonwealth um 20 really reasonable and the government's come back with initially 10 and a half percent and then they've bumped it up to 11.2 um and the union has there's been a few protected action ballots going up there's been a little bits of industrial action but the messaging internally from the union is that we we, we have to begin to prepare to settle like it's yeah. it's, a, it's a they're right. polling the membership to say you know stuff like oh if we get a better offer you know do should, should we settle straight away and you know, that's not the exact <laughs> phrasing but it's very similar like it's just this it's this weird messaging and they're going on about like you know people really want their pay rises right now and therefore you know we can't uh-huh. we can't let them we can't let them down by not getting them their pay rises that they deserve today and it's mm. just like yeah like we, this is this just isn't good enough and no one really knows like even delegates know what the, the strategy is like mm. we're not getting messaging from the executive on you know how we're going to escalate industrial action to 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 fight for a better offer it's just bits and pieces here or there um and, it, and it's really disappointing because you literally i mean yeah like Let's talk about the affiliation question because one of the other things that's in your platform is a plebiscite of CPSU members on affiliation with the ALP. Because if you're going into negotiations where Labor is in government and all of your leadership are also like senior Labor figures, you got to think like there's a bit of a conflict there, right? And like- The party yeah. of the worker is your boss. It's crazy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I And I, I think, yes, the, the strategy seems to have been over the last, you know, for, for quite some time is just a, an electoral strategy. We support Labor. Hopefully they get into government and they give us what we want rather than us fighting as workers, as a union uh, for what we deserve. And- I just wanted to read, you know, a quote from your article with Adriana in Jacobin earlier this year where you said, the CPSU has spent the last decade watching its membership decline severely while earnestly campaigning for the ALP government in the hope that it will bargain in good faith. Now the limits of this strategy are playing out. Labor is in office and bargaining over pay and conditions in the public service is in full swing and the government is not delivering. (laughs) What can you just tell us a little bit about that history of of previously CBSU wasn't affiliated mm. and then eventually the pressure built and they got on board. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and I guess yeah, yeah. How so you see it playing out, Adam? The the CBC has only been affiliated with the Labor Party um, for a decade or so, um, and that whole process. I, I wasn't a member at that time, but um, that whole process, from what I've heard, was done. It was done pretty secretly. Um, it was done kind of behind members' backs. There wasn't any sort of genuine consultation with the membership on the affiliation. There was never a vote on the affiliation. It just kind of got pushed through governing council, and it's by the same you know. Again, Again, like Stephen Jones, who is a uh, in the in government for Labor at the moment, <laughs> was the leader of the union throughout part of this right. process. So, yeah, that 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 that's the historical um, context for it all. Uh, there's parts of the the union that aren't affiliated. So CSIRO, for example, which has this interesting carve out within our mm. within the, the CPSU, aren't formally affiliated. They're smart there, the CSIRO. So that tells you something. They're, They're all smart. nerds. Okay? I, they know yeah. what's going on. They are. They, um, they are. <laughs> and. Uh, 
but again, I think they're because they're part of the bigger the bigger CPSU picture. They get dragged along with this, and we've seen like mm. the CSRA Staff Association, as they're called, their membership numbers have also declined over the same you know last 15, 20 years. So fundamentally, we think at the very least, members should at some stage, and hopefully it's in the next twelve months or so, have an opportunity to vote on this. Like we've never yeah. actually been asked, is this in your interest? So that's that's like just fundamental democracy question. Um, but on the actual question of affiliation, I, I completely agree. Like it, it doesn't make sense for me. For the public sector union, it, like no other union, the mm. bosses are you know a political grouping, right? Mm. Like Labor is in government in the ACT, they are in government in in um the, in the Commonwealth, and they are in government in the NT as well, and they are so they're they're the employers for all of our members, um and and it, and it's really it is yeah you've got to question that conflict. I don't think it, it's um a particularly I don't think many people are particularly comfortable with it. I've had many conversations over my my years as a union delegate with potential members who just say, I'm not joining the union because of the affiliation with the, mm-hmm. the ALP. Like that comes yeah. up pr- pretty often. Um, and I think the ultimate test of all of this is probably the last 12 months. So in the last 12 months, you had ACT government bargaining and APS bargaining, so Commonwealth bargaining. And in both cases, Labor and a Labor Greens government in the ACT's case um, mm-hmm. just didn't come to the table with offers that were appropriate, that, you know, guaranteed real wage rises, that didn't, you know, see our workers fall behind over the next few years um, with the cost of housing, the cost of living, et cetera. Um, so to my mind, the number one reason why you would support affiliation is because that relationship will get you the goods, but it just hasn't. So what what is the possible justification for affiliation other mm. than it helps people from the CPSU get jobs in the Labor Party or it helps them <laughs> with like a, a big part of affiliation, for example, is like the pre-selection process. So in the ACT in particular, mm. the CPSU has a block of votes that really dictate yeah. Um, particularly to say Katie Gallagher's position at, at Labor conference. So that's something that is, you know, really interesting or, you know, whatever within the Labor Party. But to a lot of members, that's that's irrelevant. Um, mm. The other thing is it costs us 180 grand a year. Like it, over the course of what affiliation, of we, we have spent millions of dollars at, uh, as a union um, affiliating the Labor members Party. Members' dues, just, right? Like that's where members' dues members are Members' dues, yeah. exactly. Um, so at the very least, this information needs to be known by members because I don't think a lot of it is. Um, and members should have a, have a choice about whether or not that, that affiliation continues, particularly after after these bargains. Do you have a prediction as to how that um, plebiscite might go? Do you think at the moment how CPSU members might vote on affiliation? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure, but from my experience and from the experience of this ticket as well, like in speaking to people who have done a whole bunch of door knocking, for example, uh, it's not particularly popular. Um, most people aren't engaged with the Labor Party who are members of, of the union. Um, and I think if you put the, the facts out there and the information out there, I think people don't see a value proposition in maintaining the affiliation. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was a plebiscite if, if the affiliation ended. Mm. Do you think, I mean, I mean, presumably then Labor would be seeing this as a pretty significant threat to its income stream and its power if this, if, if you were elected and this plebiscite got up, what's the response been from Labor to the campaign that you guys have been running? Uh, it's a really good question. We, we've we've been a little bit surprised, to be honest, because I don't, I don't think, at least not till very, very recently, they took us particularly seriously. I think I don't think they realised just how cohesive a, a ticket this was until mm. they began receiving the info from like the ballot information, for example, from the AEC. Um, mm. And then, you know, once we, we've done our own mail out, um, we, we weren't able to afford to mail out to every member, but we've still done a mail out of 17,000 members. Mm. Um, we've door knocked thousands of people. We've letterboxed thousands of people. Um, I think it's only really, really, really recently that they realized that this was serious. Um, we've also got some good media coverage too as well. Um, so there hasn't been, I guess, time for them to do a lot of, a lot of, I don't know, um, wicked whispers or whatever it is in the background <laughs> or to brief out Ask against us. Snake attack. Yeah. There's, there hasn't been a huge amount of time for that, but we have, we have kind of begun to see it. Like we've, we, mm. we, we were doing some point of entries a couple of weeks ago and um, there were questions being asked by people representing the, um, the opposing team, uh, you know, asking people, Hey, Hey, do you want your, do you want your union run by greens and communists? Um, <laughs> like that yes. kind of, that kind of thing. And well, I let, 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 <laughs> our response, this is what I find really interesting because, because these people are so like mired in Labor Party stuff. It's like the ACT votes really like quite – there's quite a significant number of True. people who vote for the Greens. Like yeah. the Greens are in government in the ACT. So at the very least, like people are pretty supportive of the Greens. So I don't, I don't know how much that's actually resonating. Um, mm. But, yeah, I think I think that, yeah, this is like this – 
I think that at least they should be listening to us. Like this is an example of a broad left group of, of unionists, people affiliated, non-affiliated with various political parties who are saying the union isn't working for us and we've gone to the effort of raising thousands of dollars and spending thousands of hours fighting an internal CPSU election because we believe our union just isn't functioning, right? We, mm. we genuinely need really urgent change. Um, and I think if the Labor Party and the CPSU and other unions don't like listen to this and look at this mm. and try and respond positively, they they're, they're doomed doomed to lose. Like I just the the yeah the the, the tides of history I guess are against them. Like our conditions are getting worse, um, and and people are up for a bit of a fight. Yeah, I mean, it does kind of remind me of Greens campaigns that like this is something that Labor has taken for granted for a long time. And then suddenly there's this little group that, you know, they dismiss at first, um, but then are like, oh, shit, these guys are actually running a a campaign uh, and that might actually win. I mean, how? Yeah. Like, what are the numbers like? Like, how many members do you need to actually win over to win this election? Keeping in mind that I think what's really interesting is the turnout numbers were like 12% last election, right? So surely you really just need to like get out the vote. Yes, exactly. So yeah, you're right. So turnout is 12% last election. Historically, it's it's really low as well. Um, and like I said, last election there was uh, you know Matt's campaign, which you know he 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 said the right things and and um, definitely his heart was in the right place. Um, but he didn't campaign, like he didn't actively campaign. Mm. So we looked at that and the fact that Matt got within you know a thousand votes of winning and said, right, if we put together a strong campaign, we've got a real chance of winning this. So. We hope the turnout is going to be higher, hopefully significantly higher. Like I don't, I don't care whether we're going to lose. I, I would love to see contested elections become a thing in CPSU mm. on an ongoing basis, and I hope this this kicks that off. Um, but looking at previous numbers and the fact that we have put together a really coordinated campaign um, and we've contacted literally thousands and thousands of members at this stage, um, I, I think we've got a good chance. And the way that preferences flow out, um, I think we've got a really good chance of getting at least one person on uh, up on the EC, which will be, you know, that will be really significant for the way that the union operates. Uh, but I, I think we've also got a decent chance of, of, of winning the whole thing. Um, and uh, I just encourage obviously any of you listeners who are a member to vote because that's the most important thing. And it's a postal ballot as well so you've got to fill in the form oh. put it back in an envelope yeah exactly and I then haven't send it off the internet so, yet. <laughs> no 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 they haven't um and that's the same with a lot of union elections to be fair like it's it's all very so like a really good example of that is that we as um as a campaign as candidates we can get access through the aec um to member data right for campaigning purposes mm-hmm. all we yeah. get given is people's addresses so we don't have mm-hmm. access to phone numbers or email addresses or anything right. and a lot okay. of addresses like workplace addresses so that's why it's been so important for us to do you know like mail out but most importantly like door knocking like to go to people's actual houses does, um, because that's the, the only executive way can, yeah sorry does the executive have access to phone numbers and stuff and like so, under the Registered Organisations <laughs> Act, you are not meant to use union resources to to, um, okay. to preference one candidate over another. Uh, this is a really tricky one. And kind of like we- how MPs aren't meant to use their parliamentary resources to campaign, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, we, 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 we've definitely we've definitely stuck to the rules on this one. Like, we've, we've said to all of our, our supporters, like, don't use union mailing lists. Like mm. just let's just focus on the the door knocking campaign. If you know someone who's a union member through your delegate work, you know, feel free free to send them a team's mm. message or whatever, or have a chat with them. You know, speak to people about it in the workplace, all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't speak for for others. We've we've definitely you know we've been on high alert for any kind of any any use of union resources, but mm. they are the incumbents. We know, for example, that um, you know people who are working for the union are involved in their campaign, like not you know not necessarily on paid time so that it's fine under the act but it is interesting that like organizers um, leaders of the union are involved in in their campaign and doing like point of entries at, at various places yeah all i can say is like we're genuinely member-led we're certainly not uh yeah. using any union resources um so <laughs> interesting yeah. interesting i thought it was really i mean just as a an aside thing i had no idea that the aec could run or ran union elections i think that's that's so interesting. The AEC is just doing a little side hustle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, I think it's a really exciting campaign. I mean, I think there's kind of some overlap when we talk about, you know, you're talking about increasing internal democracy within the union to uh, Tom and I and people within the Greens will often talk about um, how our 
leader is elected and the fact that we think when you increase democracy, you increase engagement and you probably grow the movement because more people are going to want to get involved in something that they actually have a say in and something that's actually meaningful to them. So I think there's a really similar argument when you've got declining union membership to, yeah, increase the the stakes that are at play if you actually join that union. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. And I'm always fascinated by the contrast between the rhetoric of yeah, fighting for working people, no one held back, no one left behind, you know, fighting up, uh, yeah, organizing, yada yada yada. You, you'll hear from labor and union union bureaucrats all the time, and which immediately switches into boss rhetoric. And <laughs> you're doing the wrong thing. You're upsetting. You're upset. You know, you're fucking over the movement. Mm. Once you know, rank and file members or ordinary people start organizing and start pointing out that the institutions that they're at the head of are actually fucking them over. And actually, if they really believed in democracy and working people fighting for a better life, they'd actually be very supportive of these insurgent groups like Members United. But turns out they're, they're sitting <laughs> fat. These fat cats up the top are pretty comfortable <laughs> and they don't like being disturbed. That's my read. Anyway. <laughs> That's Tom's take. Um, so when – so the – the ballots are out now, right? Like voting is yeah. open. When does it close? And I guess what else can can people do, whether they're a member or not, to support this little this little uh, grassroots insurgency? Um, so the ballots are open. If you're a CPSU member, an eligible member, you probably should have received your ballot by now in the mail. So if you haven't, um, contact the AEC just to make sure your address is right. Um, they can send out another ballot. The ballots will close on the 6th of December, but obviously you need to post it back. So make sure you've sent your ballots by the end of this month. Um, uh, and in terms of support, uh, we just go to our website, membersunitedteam.com. Um, we've also got a Facebook page. Uh, flick us a message, send us an email. Um, we were taking donations. Uh, I don't know how much utility they'll have now because a lot of that that spends happened. Um, mm. But we just keep we're keen. Like democracy for CPSU is the caucus we came out of, and that will continue. So if members are keen to be involved in organising at a rank and file level, get involved in the caucus. Um, and one of the things we really want to do if we win is to set up as many like to encourage the setting up of so many of these groups and caucuses. Like there should be a retired members caucus, for example, where like retired members come in and they discuss and they bring forward ideas for the union. There should be I think there should be like new parents groups right like while you're on a parental leave which is a really isolating process for so many people there should be a union set up and supported group that you go and you discuss with other new parents your life you know the union your job going to return to work your baby all that stuff um you know people interested in internationalist stuff you know there, there should be all of these different groups within the union um that are uh, put together and encourage the rank and file level um, and democracy for CPSU is kind of the start of that. Like we're, we're, we're trying to build a rank and file caucus. We've already got almost a hundred people involved um, and we're keen for more. So yeah, definitely. There's uh, definitely okay, ways so to I get involved. Public servants should be focused on their work and fixing potholes. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's right. And earning your taxpayers money. So <laughs> back to work, you fucking hippies. <laughs> you fucking hell. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I <laughs> can't wait to see how this turns out. I am excited. Yeah, I think it's, it's really cool and I'd love to, you know, maybe we'll see more unions doing similar things or, yeah, union members doing things within their unions in Australia. But, yeah, yeah. good luck. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, thank <laughs> you so. both. See you Cheers, later. Man. Martin, where are you? Budapest. Ah, oh, city of cathedrals. Yeah, I see you right there on the bridge of the Danube, kid. I kind of like to talk to you, you know. Well, right now, why don't you email me? Ah, uh, kind of like a, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, kind of a face-to-face -face type of thing. You know? I do it personally? Yeah, I'd love to see, you know what I mean, kid? Let's, let's do it. How you doing, kid? How are you? Yeah, kid, kid. Hey, mental telepathy, uh, astral projection, you know. Here you are. <laughs> right. What do you want? Kid, I'm putting together a little concern, which would uh, enable those of us in our rarefied profession to avoid uh, embarrassing overlaps. What, like a union? Yeah, more like a club. Work less, make more. So, yes, call to action this week. If you are in the CPSU, please um, find your ballot and, you know, vote for some rank and file members. And you can find more info about the uh, democracy for CPSU movement and the Members United ticket at membersunitedteam.com. Uh, otherwise, call to action remains to stand in solidarity with Palestine. Please call your MPs, call Senny, uh, Senator Penny Wong, support the BDS movement, go to rallies and continue spreading the word. There's heaps of information in that link that Tom mentioned before. Is it standwithpalestine.au? AU. Yeah. You can also contact your Greens MPs and say, hey, thanks. Thanks. Mm. Thanks for being that nice. That might be nice, particularly when 
they're coughing abuse from across the media spectrum and racist bullshit from assholes like Pauline Hanson. So you want to say, actually hey, make a difference. I actually think that was really good and nice and uh, that would be a, a nice thing to do. <laughs> you can it's also not tell official us. Greens Party podcast, but we are telling you to contact your Greens MPs so, and tell yeah. them that they're good. Tell them that they're good and nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of good and nice, we, yes, yeah, so 100th episode is next week. Just Whoa. a heads up that if you are not coming to the live show, sorry, your episode will be a little bit late because we're going to release that show on Sunday. Um, hot off the live press i don't know uh (laughs) um you can uh remind us to please rate and review the show on apple podcasts or if you're listening give us five stars tell us we're good and nice Uh, tell us we're good and nice also on social media at serious danger au on twitter instagram tiktok and youtube all the info for the um the live show link and also the new merch that we have out now the shirts and the stickers are at seriousdangerpod.com you'll find the links there and bye for the last um, last episode of this century. Lost double of episodes. <laughs> See you next week, everybody. Bye. Bye. Serious danger, Australia.